you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. It's Boss here from thechrisvossshow.com. Thechrisvossshow.com. Welcome to the show, my family and friends. The Chris Voss Show family. Family loves you but doesn't judge you, at least not as harshly as when I haven't had my coffee in the morning. Because uh, if I have my coffee in my morning, I'm very bearish and very, uh, I'm, I'm just ornery. I'm coming out of hibernation from the night, and uh, I need my coffee, and if you mess with me, people will die so uh just remember if you're in the chris Voss show family podcast you're not in my family you're in my podcast but if you happen to be wandering around my house in the morning or the office uh make sure that i've had my coffee first because i will judge you but until then we won't so there you go uh as always folks uh that's our lead-in to remind you and guilt and shame to uh give us a five-star review on the itunes there we love it when you do it i usually sit and weep silently in happiness whenever someone gives us a five-star review over there tells us how much they love us and i just go my god people love me <laughs> also for the show to your family friends and relatives go to goodreads.com for says chris Voss. linkedin.com for says chris Voss. subscribe to the big linkedin newsletter the hundred thirty thousand linkedin group over there uh go to uh tiktok we're starting to be cool over there tiktok forward slash chris Voss one as well and i think i mentioned youtube you guys know where it's at just go do it enlighten your friends neighbors relatives you're only as smart as the five people that surround you so if the five people that surround you don't listen to the show and you listen to the show, I mean, yeah, you do have the benefit of being the smartest person in the room, but seriously, they're going to drive you crazy unless you get, you know, you get their IQs up. So get them involved in the show. Uh, we're going to be talking about leadership today, and it's one of my favorite topics. After writing my book, Beacons of Leadership, and owning companies since I was 18, I, I've done a few companies, and uh, leadership is important. And it's not just being a CEO. Parents are leaders. There's everyday leaders that uh, surround us every, everywhere, but uh, we're going to be talking about some things that gave me an epiphany with this gentleman coming on the show that uh, opened my eyes to a few new things about leadership and how to be a great leader, when, regardless of what you do and how you apply your leadership, whether it's being a great mom or dad or whether it's being the CEO of a $50 trillion company or being a great entrepreneur. So I think you're going to be really surprised and interested in what he has to offer. And we're going to be talking to him on the show about all the good stuff. So we're going to get to that here in a second. He is the author of the latest book to come out, August 30th, 2022. Uh, the title of the book is My Daily Leadership, A Powerful Roadmap for Leadership Success. I'm joined today by Antonio Garrido. And he's going to be talking to us about his amazing book and insight. He's the author of this latest book and founder and president of My Daily Leadership, a leadership development organization with a mission to inspire one million, only one million of the world's best leaders to reach their full potential. He's working. He's going to start with a million. He's going to hit the other seven billion or eight billion. Is it eight billion now? There you go. Plenty of time. Uh, Antonio has over 25 years in senior leadership positions with world-class businesses. He's an expert in leadership transformation, shaping high-performance leaders out of highly stressed and overworked leaders. Uh, Antonio blends his own vast commercial experience with proven techniques to embed a unique brand of leadership development. He's a serial entrepreneur, a successful business coach, charismatic speaker, and leader from small private businesses, right up to fortune 60 size welcome to the show antonio how are you <laughs> hello chris gosh there's so much to say about that introduction i'm delicious thank you what a great introduction i got from that not only do you have a high need for caffeine but you also have a high need for approval so it's probably like most leaders that we deal with i suppose there but you I'm go not... yeah. and i was teasing you about inspiring one million you know maybe there's only so much time one guy has for real you know so you know. yeah i thought we'd start modest you know modest yeah. all yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it, 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 it's it's like it's like the uh, it's like a marathon. You start with the first uh, million miles, and then and then yeah, there you go. Uh, so, 
Welcome to the show. Congratulations yeah. on the new book. Give us your dot com so people can look you up on the interwebs and find out it more. It could be easier. It's mydailyleadership. So all the W's, mydailyleadership.com, all one word. Pop along, see what we have to say. There you go. So you've launched this book, and mm -hmm. uh, what motivated you want to write this? Oh, <laughs> uh, because of all of the leaders that we work with and <laughs> helping them uh, deal with their challenges, I suppose. I don't know how I'm, – I'm fairly ancient. So let's say 20-odd years ago, perhaps even more, a very enlightened leader of mine, my boss, right, um, mm -hmm. group chairman of a very large, complex organization, called me into his office one day. I'd only been with the company for two, two or three days and um, asked me whether or not I journaled. And uh, I said, no. And he asked why. And I said, and I wasn't entirely really sure why. So I just said, probably because I'm not a 16-year-old Victorian schoolgirl, right? Because I didn't know who else would journal other than those. I'm not right? keeping a diary, damn it. Exactly. Mr. Darcy was mean to me today, right? Um, so <laughs> so I crushing on really quickly the, the the value of this kind of self-reflection and you know the, the the importance of journaling for doing that so so i have been uh, journaling avidly for the longest time and the more time we spent helping uh working with uh c-suite leaders from the small to the very very big b2b b2c all markets all industries and so on i i also realized that those that journal did much better than those that didn't and i pulled those two things together and i thought hey let's um let's let's put a program together to help those that are serious about growing and uh, and so we did and it's been um uh it's been a a, a rollicking good ride and a, and a and a great success so we've been very fortunate in that regard i suppose this is my third book but i have to say this is probably my favorite book there you go well they just get better with time i think it's, yeah yeah the more, you, the more yeah. you do it and the longer you live you the more experience you have so give us a synopsis of a thirty thousand overview uh, of, of the book and kind of what what it entails what's inside and then we'll get into some of the deets as we go through the show so oh, I, I guess it's just as I mentioned in terms of, you know, so many people, so many leaders really, you know, want to be the, the best that they can be, or at least they claim to be, a claim to want that. And then when we ask them how much time did they spend trying to develop their self-awareness, how much time did they spend reflecting on their, uh, you know, their, their behaviors and their results. And, and, and it's, it's staggeringly, uh, it, it's, it's it's a dis disturbing and <laughs> depressingly low number and so um yeah so the, the principle of I, I, probably a good way to describe it is this i i did a talk not too long ago to 400 leaders around the world all industries all sizes all of that kind of nonsense and i asked them by a show of hands who here has no leadership blind spots, right? So fortunately enough, Chris, right, nobody put their hands up. So that was a good start. So I uh -huh. said, okay, terrific. So now that we know, so good self-awareness, round of applause for that. Now that we know that we do have some leadership blind spots, do me a favor and could you just take a minute and write down for me what they are, right? And, and <laughs> there's, there's, exactly, there's the problem. They don't know what they are. And here's the other thing that never happens, Chris, right? Nobody, let's, let's, let's say George, right? So nobody comes and knocks on George's door in the morning and says, hey, boss, you got five minutes? And George says, yeah, come in, sit down. What's, what's on your mind? You know, open door policy. You know me. Um, yeah, George, I just wanted to let you know that uh, I've been watching your performance over the last six months. And I think you're dreadful in nearly every regard. I think you're terrible. It's an awful of that. And, uh, and Have you been talking to my employees? <laughs> right, exactly. And so when I, I always ask us another supplementary question, like what percentage of the time do you think your people are telling you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, <laughs> right? Because, because I make them put their hand on a Bible. Yeah, well, it's not a hundred. I you know neither is neither is zero one. But so when we wrap all of that up, and, and a, a comment that I loved from we were talking presidents just earlier before mm -hmm. we came on air, um, uh, George Bush Senior. Um, he'd uh, he he you know he was no longer the president, but you chaps still call ex presidents Mr. President. But anyway, he was in a 
uh, a pro-am golf tournament, right? And he walked off the 18th green and somebody shoved the camera into his face and said, how was the golf, Mr. President? And he thought for a second and he said, you know, it's amazing how many games of golf he's lost since leaving the White House, right? Because, you know... When you're the CEO, when you decide to pay rises, when you uh, decide where people park in the car park, you know, getting to that truth is difficult. So who's going to tell you? Yeah. Unless you take some kind of, you know, sub, uh, objective, not subjective assessment and uh, start to build your self-awareness. And journaling is a mechanism, the best mechanism for doing that. Right. Unless you do that, then you are doomed to, you know, new day, same old nonsense, really, I suppose. There you go. A lot to unpack there we'll get to. Uh, uh, tell us about your hero's journey. What got you down this road? What got you interested in this field and writing about leadership and stuff? What's your, what's your journey of life that uh, got you down this road? So probably only interesting to me, <laughs> my mother. But So when I came out of university, as I say, a million years ago, so I'm fairly ancient, I was an architect. So I was an architect for a little while. Uh, much more by luck than judgment, I found myself... Uh, running uh, a, a tiny department of a, an organization, um, at like a drawing office. And I, that department kind of over oversells it. But, you know, I, I thought that if I were to go into architecture, I'd be designing airports and cathedrals, <laughs> all that kind of nonsense day in and day out. That wasn't the case. It was normally Mrs. Miggins' kitchen extension and so on. But anyway, it, it, it was slightly... Uh, unfulfilling role but i found myself in management fairly quickly wow. and then i uh, continued to get promoted for uh when i asked my my ceo why he kept promoting me he told me the reason i might tell you the reason later if you're interested but anyway so i then found myself uh, running a, a company and then was poached and poached and poached and, and i got to an organization pretty large german organization who said hey listen if you want to get into the c-suite of this business you need to go back to university and get a, an mba <laughs> or, or you know you, architecture is fine but you know strategic market management might be a bit better so so i went and did my second degree in that and then because i was lucky enough to work for just outrageously inspired uh, uh leaders that's where my kind of, I, I was like, what's the difference between this chap and that chap? Why is this successful and not? So I, I worked for some great companies, I say Fortune 60 companies. And then about 12 or 14 years ago, I thought, you know, I will, um, I'll start my own company uh, to doing this. Uh, I almost said nonsense, but doing this stuff. It's the company that we, you and I were talking about before we came on in Miami. Uh, and that company just grew gangbusters. We, we, and that's really kind of sales and management and marketing and uh, uh, kind of sales leadership. And then I wrote this book and thought it's a separate brand. It's not the same thing. I didn't want to confuse stuff. So, yeah. So we started this business, which was which is exclusively uh, leadership development. So that's my genesis architecture to this. How it wasn't by design. The, the whole thing is an, an, an entire fluke. But, you know, some of the best things are, I suppose. And we learn so much as we go down the pathway. <laughs> I'm sure there was there was things you learned as you went through, you know, as you went up through the levels of management and stuff. So let's unpack some of the things that we talked about in your 30,000 overview. You know, you, you talked about how you talk about blind spots. Some people mm -hmm. call them scotomas, mm -hmm. um, you know. Uh, the one thing I imparted to my niece and nephew when they turned 18 was there are three things that are very important in life. What you know, what you know you don't know. But the most important thing you got to figure out is the things you don't know you don't know. Because yeah. many times those will be the things that come at you like a freight train, as Metallica puts it, like a freight train uh, coming your way and you think it's a light in the end of the tunnel and it's not. It's a freight train. And yes. it's not going to be pretty. And so <laughs> trying to trying to identify those things. And so it, it's interesting. You sat down with CEOs and you asked them what their blind spots are. And then you talked about George Bush, you know, where, you know, sometimes you can be surrounded by yes men. Uh, one of the things that, you know, I identified early on with my CEO, as I said, I remember going to my uh, one of my last CEOs that I worked for that finished off my training to be a CEO. And, and I said, you know, you always have that one guy, negative Nancy, who's on the board and whatever 
he's always the uh, 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 he's always the uh, the opposite dude or the uh, uh, I want to say authoritarian. Yeah, he's always the foil. He, you know, whatever if you say right, he goes left. Yeah. Uh, you know, and and it almost seems like he just goes left because you go right. Yeah. Uh, if, and then if you go left, he's going to write. And, and, and he said to me, he's Chris, it's really important to have that guy on the board because the worst thing you do is surround yourself with yes men and you don't know where so, the truth is. You don't know where the stuff is. So can I tell you who first developed that principle? Who? If you're interested, you know, through any military structure. We are. We are. It was um, Napoleon. Oh, no. So Napoleon, right. We were talking about French, <laughs> your Frenchman just before we came on air as well. Right. Yeah. But Napoleon, Napoleon, who, you know, did rather well in terms of, you know, became self-acclaimed emperor of the world, but he he controlled, or France controlled, um, getting on for uh, a third of the world. Uh, did France have more people than anybody else, more resources than anybody else, more horses than anybody else? No. But what Napoleon figured out, and it was genius, really, he figured out pretty early on that... Um, when he so let's imagine that there is an objective, right? So all CEOs have objectives, right? So mm -hmm. so Napoleon had an objective, and it may be to besiege a city, for example. Um, he figured out pretty early that that when he was in the tent, you know, the forward tent, deciding how they were going to, you know, enter the city and you know, um, rape the cattle and stampede the women, right? Whilst whilst they were deciding how to do that, right? Everyone kind of agreed with him. And he realized that you know, everyone's agreeing with me because of who I am, as opposed to the, the genius, the proposition, you know, the idea. So he took one of his generals that they, the, the nomenclature of it became the idiot general. And he sent them out of the tent. And then all of the other generals and he would put a plan together to besiege the city. Once uh -huh. the plan was fixed, they would then call the other general back. And one of the other generals would describe to that general, the idiot general, right, what the plan is. And, and he had no idea which components were whose idea, right? So <laughs> he didn't know which bits Napoleon liked and which bits. Of, oh, so everything. he wasn't worried about pissing off the boss then. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that, that, that single strategy, you know, in terms of dealing with yes men and so on, that single strategy helped him conquer, you know, a third of the world. So, you know, not... It's you know it's difficult because we, we we talked also about what percentage of the time the leaders hear the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth and they would like to think it's one hundred percent but it, I promise you it isn't what what everyone is telling the bosses a version of the truth that they think it's in their best interest to have him or her believe right and so one of the things that the leader has to do is close that truth gap and how do they do that again it comes back to this EQ and self awareness has to be you got to leave your ego. My, uh, my, my partner in the Miami business, he's got a lovely expression about this um, in terms of, you know, having low ego. And, and in the military, they say, leave your stripes at the door, right? Oh. But uh, he says, you know, most leaders, they can either feed their ego or feed their kids, right? You can't have both. <laughs> and I, I love that as an expression. I didn't put it in the book because that wasn't mine, but... Um, yeah, I, I, now I've just said it out loud. I think I've put it in some social media. Posts. There you go. Well, I mean, you can you can quote other people, you know, as long yeah. as you have attribution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just don't like giving him plaudits. Okay, well, we'll, we'll work that out on a separate podcast. Yeah, we'll bring the two of you in and have you work it out. Uh, so there you go. Uh, but so one of the things I teased out in my intro was yep. the epiphany you gave me when I was going through some of your stuff. As we talked about in the pre-show, I read some of your uh, uh, posts on um, LinkedIn. And so people can follow you over there. You have a great uh, little, follow little following. I'm sorry, I don't mean to uh, demean that. Uh, you have a great following over there. Um, I meant that as like, you know, uh, the comedy yep. bit of it. Uh, so um, on there, uh, you, you talked about this journaling. And, uh, you know, I journal... Uh, I know most successfully in his journal, but I never really put it together. And we'd had somebody earlier this week on the show where we were talking about leadership and being self-aware. And, uh, and, and it, it hit me that journaling is one of the best ways to be self-aware or develop yeah. self-awareness. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a constant road of, of achievement and getting to know yourself better. But if you're not self-actualized as a leader, uh, I think you're going to suck. Am I wrong? Or you tell me more. 
Well, you certainly won't reach, reach your maximum potential, that's for sure. There and then if you can't reach your maximum potential, then you can't help your people reach their maximum potential. And therefore, by default, you can't help your business reach, reach its maximum potential. And your job as a leader is to future-proof yourself, right, and your, your organization. Because as uh, Marshall Goldsmith says, one of our all-time business you know, gurus and heroes, you know, what got you here won't get you there. And so, and we know that the pace of change is ever faster, right? Mm-hmm. AI, the last five minutes and before that, the internet and before that and before that and three, you know, all of that. Yeah, stuff. it's moving um, faster, faster, it yeah, seems faster, too. Faster and faster and faster. So the, the requirement then to future-proof ourselves is is ever increasing. So, so we have to figure out how do we maximize our potential? How do we develop our people to maximize their potential? And then how do we maximize? Because what's a, what's a leader's job is to make decisions and to future-proof the business. That's that's what they get paid for, right? And the way they do that is to is to maximize themselves, their people, and their and by default their business. That's their. It's not only their job. That's their responsibility. And if they're not prepared to do that, in my view, and it's harsh then they should go do something else. And, and, the, and the leaders that ask us to work with them but are not prepared to make that kind of investment in themselves, we don't, we don't help them because, because they don't mean it. And anybody that, any leader that says they're, that they are genuinely interested in developing themselves and their people and their organization and they don't journal, don't believe them, and they're not prepared to either, then, then, then don't believe them. So it's, it's just BS. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, it's 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 something where um, if you're not self-aware, self-actualized, you know, I always tell people being um, being an entrepreneur will will change you if you let it. And, and if you really have to work hard, unless, you know, you have a bunch of money and you don't have to develop yourself, I suppose you can isolate yourself with money. <clears throat> and we see people that fail with sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars or sometimes of billions of dollars in investments. There's been some recent massive tech failures that uh, you yeah. know had had so much money it was stupid and they still couldn't yeah. make success yeah, I mean, i'm yeah. thinking i'm thinking of things like clubhouse there was a pizza company that was going to do mobile pizza delivery mobile pizza making in in a trucks and then deliver them so they would be you know steaming hot right off the truck and i think they had close to a billion dollars they failed but uh uh let's talk about uh and delve into this a little bit um mm-hmm. When, 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 with journaling, how does one, how does one, uh, you know, uh, develop the insight uh, to take in journal and do, do, do you really need to, you know, not yeah. focus when you're journaling on other people? Like, like, you know, I mean, I used to come home and tell stories about my employees. Like you won't believe what Bob did today that, or does it more need, need to be more internalized where you go, Hey, what did I do today? And how can I do better? Uh, good question. So this insight piece, and, and, and so many organizations are actually recruiting leaders now specifically for insight, others for EQ, where in the past we always thought it was IQ and technical skill, and maybe even time served, but it's none of those things anymore. The best of the best companies are looking for this, this ability to see between the numbers and wood for the trees and emotional intelligence and all that kind of stuff. But before I tell you that, can I give all of your listeners a quick exercise to do? Please do. Yeah, so because I like to give theory as well as practical application. And I'll, I'll tell a super quick story, then I promise I'm going to come back to this, how do we develop insight, I promise. Right. So, um, so the same chap that I told you about a million years ago who said, do you journal? And I said, no, because I'm not a 16 year old Victoria. Okay, that one. Um, uh, so then I was on the journaling you know, uh, process. I was like most of our clients that were askers, well, what do we write and how often and what, and you know, we would if we knew what to write and all that kind of stuff. We, that's the least of it. And we give everybody all of that. So, so we make it a very light load, but it's an everyday load, just like brushing your teeth. But anyway, so he said this, and here's what I'd like all of your uh, uh, viewers and listeners uh, to think about mm-hmm. your audience to think about. So, so this group uh, chair, chairman asked me into his office again this is one of this is this very one of my very inspirational leaders and he said hey antonio he said have you ever worked for a dreadful boss um and i said yeah of course of course i have hasn't everybody he said yeah yeah probably so then he got himself a piece of paper 
and uh, a pen. And he said, will you just write down what does leadership dreadfulness look like? What does a dreadful boss look like? Characteristics, five or six. So I wrote down five or six things that I could imagine most of your audience are thinking maybe you're yeah, uh, inconsistent, place favorites, micromanagers, uh, hot and cold, uh, place whatever, right? Um, not strategic, everything's tactical, uh, uh, reactive, not responsive, all of those things, right? Um, so I wrote a list of things, gave that back to him, and he said, yeah, yeah, terrific, write some more, right? And slid the piece of paper back. So I wrote some more things of leadership dreadfulness, and then, sent, you know, passed it back, and he passed it back again. He said, write me some more. So anyway, long story short, I got to about 15 things that, that in my view, were like... <sighs> you know, the, the most dreadful things that leaders could do. He said, he said, that's a really good list. I love it. I love it. That's really, really good. He said, now will you do me a favor? I said, yeah. He said, whilst ever you are the CEO or managing director there, but it's the CEO, the principal is the same. Whilst ever you're the CEO of this organization, can you promise me you'll never do any of the things on that piece of paper? <laughs> right. And I went, well, I'll try. He says, no, 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 just don't ever do any of those things. <laughs> He said, okay. And he said, I'll tell you what. He said, carry it with you at all times. Whenever I see you in the corridor or pass you in the canteen or whatever, uh -oh. he said, get that list out and we'll have a conversation about some of those things. So so that started my, you know, this insight that you were talking about, this mm -hmm. self-awareness, this, this reflective and reflexive practice. He then asked me another question. And this is this is the point to it. Then I'll tell you how the in, where the insight comes from, right? Mm -hmm. He said, uh, he said, ask yourself two questions every day. He said, I ask myself two questions every day. The two questions are, um, <clears throat> did I earn my money today? And did I, did I try my best? Not did I do my best? Because he said, no, you, you almost never do your best. Do your, doing your best is the 100-meter runner that every single day when he practices and trains, he gets a personal best. I mean, that's just impossible. Right? But did I, did I earn my money today? And did I try my best? Here's what happens. When you start to, and he said, he said, if there are ever three consecutive days where you think you haven't turned your money, he said, can you come and talk to me and we'll chat about that? It's sort of wow. very, very kind of veiled threat, like you'll soon find yourself on the job market, right? Wow. So, yeah. So I said, well, I like this guy. Yeah. Oh, I love this guy. So here's why I think I did, you know, I tried my best today and da 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 And he goes, no, that's nonsense, right? So he said this. He said, look, when you start saying, did I earn my money today? Did I try my best today? Not did I do my, did I try my best today? When you start asking yourself that question every day, what then happens, Chris, is you go, well, you know what? I'll give myself an A minus for today mm -hmm. because when I said this, maybe I could have said that. When I did this, maybe I could have done that. Perhaps I could have said that or done that or not, right? Maybe I could have done this better. Well, that, well, so what that then does, Chris, is it starts to build that self-awareness muscle that we talked about. But unfortunately, it's all in the rearview mirror. It's retrospective, right? It's hindsight. Yeah. Now, the thing about when you do that, when you do that hindsight analysis with enough frequency and with enough seriousness, right? When you constantly look back, what then happens is before too long, Chris, somebody asks you a question in the moment, in the present, and asks you, hey, boss, what should we do about this? What do you think we should do about that, right? And you know, oh, crikey, I'm going to have to review my answer in about four hours, right, when I get to my journal, right? So you, so you think to yourself, do you know what? I'm going to give an A. I'm going to give a world class leader's. What would a world class leader say to this, right? Or how would they respond to this? And so you go from a hindsight to in the moment insight. Now, when you do that with enough frequency, what then happens is you develop foresight, right? So hindsight, insight, foresight. And that foresight allows you to just see the tiny piece of the iceberg, piece peeking above the waves, right? And knowing that there's like all of this stuff <laughs> below, but, and you're the Titanic and you think, okay, let's, let's make it, let's course correct now, rather than when this issue becomes too big and, and, and it leads to foresight. So hindsight, insight, foresight, and we have, you know, our program, 
you know, addresses that specifically and does that specifically. But it's interesting to think, what does dreadful look like? And when you define dreadful, it makes you start kind of define what does, what does gorgeous look like, right? And then you can start to, well, how do I measure against that? And how could I get closer to that? And da -da 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 -da, and good things happen. There you go. Uh, and and this, is, this is the journey that I think more leaders need to go on because yeah. we talked about the pre-show. You know, I, I, I've heard of, uh, I think there's a famous baseball player who would literally keep a library of swings, not just his swings, but he would have uh, all the top players' swings record on video cassette or something. And he would watch them, how they would hold their arms, how they would hold their elbows, how they would swing, how they would approach the ball and all the mechanics of the thing. And we've, you know, we've had Olympic coaches on the show uh, and everyone's talked about, you know, all the coaching that they do for people and, and trying to develop self-awareness of just integral parts. In fact, there's, there's a uh, extensive scientist stuff they do with the uh, science that they do with the uh, Olympic things where they'll, yeah. you know, they'll cover them in nodes and, yeah. and do like a, a computerized thing of, of how they're utilizing their body. But a lot of times when I ask CEOs uh, in my experience, you know, what is your leadership style? Uh, how do you lead? What is, you know, what are the core natures of, of your leadership uh, attributes? They have no idea. No, they're just like, they're just like running on whatever. And I, I know they have a little bit of a toolbox that they use and, and, uh, you know, it kind of works for them if they will, but I don't, you know, a lot of them are just like, I don't know. I just got blazed. I don't know what it is. I, uh, I know. Is that, is that what you find as well? Yeah, absolutely. And we talk uh, like all of the time. Uh, and here's an interesting statistic, or here's an interesting fact that surprises most leaders when we first tell them. Uh, and it, it relates to, you know, you were talking about sports, for example, but it's the same in many, you know, it can be entertainment. It can. It, it doesn't just have to be sports. So the military, for example, the military are, are, are world class at this kind of stuff. And so let's take Top Gun as an example. You know, when I'm talking about this, this evaluated experience. So mm -hmm. Top, I mean, the place, not the film, right? So... Um, so there is, you know, for those that don't know, Top Gun is a movie, but it's actually based on a real place called Top Gun. And Top Gun, what do they? What do you imagine they train them? What's the purpose of Top Gun, Chris? Because it isn't to teach them how to fly a plane, right? Because mm -hmm. because they know how to fly a plane, they wouldn't be there unless they were the best of the best of the very, very, very best. So they know That's how true. to fly planes. So it's not that. What do you imagine that they, they do in when Top Gun, uh, you know, the real place, not the movie. Uh huh. What do you what? imagine? They do? You, you tell not... us. You tell us. Okay. Well, so here's the thing. I didn't so watch what... the movie, so I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> I never right? saw Top Gun. It's nothing like the movie, but so let's imagine then we've got uh, some pilots and they're being, you know, briefed before, you know, a training event or before an event. And they'll say, okay, you're going to come in. You'll enter theater at this speed, this altitude, this height. And you'll enter at this speed and this bearing and this height. And, and then, you know, go. And then we'll just try and have a dog fight and see who wins, right? And then they go and do that thing. And then they'll come back and land and they'll talk about it. They'll review it. They will do an assessment. They'll do a debrief. So the the... The, the actual dogfighty thing that they do, right, is uh -huh. it's normally about just three or four minutes. You know, it's not hours. <laughs> it's just three or four minutes, uh, maybe five or six minutes maximum. And then they go back and talk about it and, and, and they debrief and they assess. How long do you imagine they assess the, you know, four or five minutes? What do you think? I know the answer to this. They they do it as long as it takes to debrief, but usually it's about 45 minutes to an hour. It's 45 minutes to an hour for every minute. So yeah. if it's a four-minute thing, it's it's like it's oh, really? the whole of the rest of the day. They'll yeah. fly for four minutes, and then they'll review for the whole of the 45 minutes for yeah. every minute. That's true. Most they pick it apart, and even the leaders uh, admit they're wrong, and the – the non-leaders are yeah. are are uh, it, it's open forum where the non-leaders can criticize the leader and go, hey, yeah. at at this point in our flight path, you you fuck this up, yeah. and uh, and everybody, it's it's like a self accountability sort it, of. It's, uh, it's exactly that. And so, mm -hmm. when was the last time the CEO did that? You know, <laughs> yeah, I, I I asked the CEO just last week. 
So tell me about your annual board meeting. How did that go with all of your shareholders? He went, oh, really, really well. I said, okay, what makes you say that? He went, well, because this reason, this reason, this reason, mm. this reason. I said, all right, terrific. I said, um, when you think back about over that board meeting, whose voice do you remember hearing more than anybody else? <laughs> you know what? And he goes, well, mine. I said, oh, okay. Yeah. So, I was on stage barking at them. Yeah. yeah. That's how most shareholder meetings go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So what, so what did you learn? I asked. <laughs> And he went, uh, coffee, anybody want a coffee? Right. It's just the self-awareness. <laughs> Honestly, Chris, you would think that the great and the good and these people who have been, you know, running the largest, most complex organizations in the world, you would think that they are the Lionel Messi's of the world, right? But you come earlier, you said, you know, baseball players, they watch hours and hours of, of, of film of themselves mm -hmm. and others. Right, same in football, same in soccer, same in tennis, same everywhere, same in Top Gun. Why don't leaders? Why don't leaders intentionally build their self awareness? All they think is, well, what I'm doing so far, it got me here, right? It got me here, so so I can't be that dreadful. And of course, of course, they're not. But the issue is, do you want? Do you want to be okay? And I'll often say this before we even train, uh, coach, take on any client, we'll ask them this question. Do you want to be okay? Do you want to be good? Do you want to be above average? Do you want to be best in class or do you want to be world class? Which, what do you want to be? And if they don't say world class or best in class, we won't take them on, right? Because they don't have that appetite. They don't, they, they won't put in the reps. They, 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 they are not prepared to get far enough outside their comfort zone. And you and I both know, Chris, that there's no growth in your comfort zone and there's no comfort in your growth zone. So, so unless you're prepared oh. to get comfortable being uncomfortable, this isn't for you, right? Go and go and go and go to the tennis club and get yourself a prawn sandwich and enjoy it. Put your feet up. Can you give us that line again? Cause that was a great epiphany uh, and, and a great uh, little axiom. About the, there's no there's growth, no growth. In your comfort zone and yeah. there's no comfort in your growth zone, but it's true, right? Yeah, because, because if you're not prepared, because we all know that magic happens outside your comfort zone, right? So, and and so what a lot of leaders do is, you know, that because of ego, right? They mm -hmm. they don't want to take too many risks. They don't want to be. They, they, uh, Brene Brown, if uh, if anybody's watched Dare to Lead with Brene Brown, where she has said that the best leaders have the courage to say, "I don't know, I'm not sure." help what do you think right and those are the best ones because they have enough professional humility to say i, I don't have to know everything and they're brave enough to say help and those yep. are the best those are the ones that we help one of the most important things i learned at a very young age i can't remember who it was that turned me on to this knowledge but henry ford they tried to take away his company because he had a fourth grade education when it became successful mm -hmm. and the board i think believe the board of directors and and other people were like hey this guy's you know not the brightest let's try and take his company from him and he appeared in uh, according to the way the story was told to me is yeah. he appeared in um court and from the stand they you know they're asking him you know how is it that you think you're smart enough to run you know this very successful company that you've now built and he said, you know, I don't know everything. He goes, but I have a, a little uh, a, a pad or something, uh, some sort of device, electronic device on my desk. And I have all these experts that I've surrounded myself with. And any question that I want an answer for, I can push a button and that person will come in and answer my questions <laughs> or give me the data I need. So I don't, he basically, the communication was, I don't need to know everything and I need to be self-aware that I don't know everything, but I need to have access to the knowledge and insight when I need it. Whenever, whenever, gorgeous. Whenever a CEO thinks they're the smartest guy in the room, they got problems. <laughs> I learned a long time ago, man, I do not have the corner on all the great ideas. I have but, some. But Chris, you'd be staggered about how many of them think they are the smartest. You're yeah. flabbergasted. It's an easy buy-in because you're yeah. you're the leader and people worship you. And if you're not careful, you can get caught up in the egotism of it. And and then you start making all the wrong decisions. Yeah. And then uh, you know, uh you, you 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 suddenly, you know, nothing's working and you're like and the mirror is staring at you. And you know, you could try laying off people, but 
uh, sometimes after you lay it off enough people, it becomes really obvious where everyone's going like, well, you fired everyone and everything still sucks. So it could be you. My coach. My there coach. My coach is a fourth generation submarine commander. So he was a commander of a nuclear submarine. His father wow. was. His father was a diesel submarine and his father a diesel. And his son is actually in the Navy. I mean, talk about pressure. But anyway, so he, he one of our very, very first sessions, uh, he asked me this. He said, hey, question for you, Antonio. He said, well, there was uh, – we, we were about four months from Baltimore. Mm -hmm. We we were under the Arctic Circle, around the Arctic Circle. We've been about four months tracking four months tracking red submarines across the globe. That's kind of Chinese and Russian submarines, mm -hmm. whilst ever trying to remain undetected. So that's what they were doing. They were just tracking submarines whilst ever remaining undetected. That was their goal at this particular time. And he said and it was four a.m. in the morning, four months under under uh, underway. I was asleep in my quarters. And he said, unfortunately, uh, uh, an 18 year old, a young chap, uh, a welder, uh, uh, 4 a.m., had an accident whilst he was welding and he electrocuted himself and in, uh, died almost instantly. Oh, no. And I went, oh, gosh, that's okay, terrible. He said, yeah, 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 terrible. Whose fault? And I went, uh, he said, well, before you answer, let me give you some options. Mm -hmm. Is it his fault or was it his fault? Was it? The, the person that asked him to do that at 4 a.m., was it the person that trained him? Was the person that's supposed to be accompanying him? Was it, uh, was it the person who's in watch? Was it, was it, whose fault was it? And I mm -hmm. said, uh, I, I feel that it was his fault, but I also feel that it was your fault. I said, it was entirely my fault wow. because it's my submarine. And I said, yeah. you were asleep. And he went, yeah, I was asleep. But when I take on the role, when I assume the captains, I accept responsibility for anything that happens on the ship, right? And mm -hmm. I go, oh, cool. So when we say, coming back to your point, right? So when we say to a CEO, um, how many how many people report to you? Let's just let's just imagine a number. And I say, okay, well you've got you probably got twenty percent standard deviation bell chart, twenty percent A players, sixty percent B players, twenty percent C players. Name me a C player. And I go, Frank. Give me another C player, George. How long has Frank been with you? Uh, six years. How long has George been with you? Four years. Anybody else? Yeah, probably Mary. How long has Mary been with you? Yeah, about nine months. And I'll say, okay, cool. Um, tell me this: Did you hire them like that, or have you made them like that? Right, these C players. Right. And then they'll go, oh. I don't know. I said, well, so whose fault is it that they're here? And they'll go, probably HR. And I'll go, no. <laughs> right? Wow. Uh, it's your submarine. And then I'll go, tell me about the numbers. Said, yeah, we're a bit behind this year. So whose fault is that? And I go, CRO. I go, no, it's your submarine. It's not the chief revenue officer. How, how are you doing with you're on time in full? Yeah, we're about 84%. What should you be? 90%. Whose fault's that? manufacturing director no <laughs> it's your submarine right so, so how can and and so many leaders they think they are a star players but they're surrounded by b players and i say you only get an a star when all of your people get an a star yeah when there you go all get an a star you do and until they do you don't and that's your job and and that's one of the these epiphanies which is like oh i guess it's my submarine i guess there everything that happens here is my responsibility so if i want the world to get better I better look in the mirror before I start, you know, start handing out. You know, there you go. I love that analogy. I'm going to put that on my wall. It's oh, my, it's, it's, it's my your submarine. submarine or my but submarine. It is. Who else? It is. The yeah. buck stops here. I, I used to keep something on my desk that uh, basically inferred that um, just because you have a title doesn't mean anything and that you've got to earn that every day. And, yeah. Uh, and yeah, people don't realize the buck stops here. The leader sets the tone from, from the top down and uh i mean and and also not only sets the tone because you can put a bunch of bs mission statements and you know all sorts of pr but unless you live it work it deliver it and set an example to people because people see through your bs i mean i, I tell this whether your leader is a parent you know your child sees your bs you know if you tell your child don't lie and then you lie to them well um yeah they're like <clears throat> mom and dad's full of shit 
Same thing with and a leader. How, and know? how many leaders? How many leaders? Sorry, it's going to crush you there. That you know, people will people will watch what you do much more than they listen to what you're saying. How many leaders judge themselves yeah. by their intentions, but everyone else by their actions? Right? How many? Exactly. Leaders? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. We mentioned George W. Bush Sr. earlier, and yeah. and uh, I, he was an interesting and amazing man, especially when I saw him in his his later years, almost ninety, yeah. jumping out of yeah. airplanes. I'm like, man, I haven't jumped out of an airplane. I'm young. He's this right. guy's got more going on than I do. But yeah. you know, uh, a good funny example is when he said, uh, "Read my lips, no new taxes," and then he did something completely different. <laughs> it didn't work out too well on read like. No, that. no. <laughs> and uh, it's 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 cited as one of the things that sunk him. So well, there, you know, were, there were no new taxes. He just put all the other tax rates up. I mean, there were no new yeah. ones, right? Oh, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't also help the economy kind of tanked right at the same time. But yeah. people that really stuck with people. That was one of the things they found that stuck with them. And people watch how you act, you know. And that's why it's important to be self aware as we come around full circle with that. Because yeah, yeah. if people are watching how you act and you're not aware of how your performance and in, in the standards and morals and ethics and emotional intelligence you talk about in the book, uh, talk about then there or that. Uh, we, uh, we're running out of time on the show yeah. as we approach the hour, but I want to tease out a few things on your book and I'll let you decide if you want to, if you want to tease out any of those as we go, but I want people to know about them because I, I found them incredibly interesting. Um, you talk about in your book about aligning with five core elements of exceptional leadership you talk yeah. about the three C's of alignment from conversation to collaboration, uh, identifying your uh, blind spots, et cetera, et cetera, and 20 critical performance competencies that leaders yeah. need to proof, uh, future-proof themselves. Um, any, um, any final thoughts as we go out that you want to tease out, but people should definitely pick up the books so they can yeah, dive into the rest of that. A really nice question. Thank you. I think I would say a, a couple of things, and I don't want these to sound like trite kind of uh, throwaway words that you can put on a coaster, right? But um, one of the things I'd like your audience to think about is what's the difference between leading and managing? Mm. Yes. Now, we can we have a model in the book, and please do, you know, it talks about those 20 competencies and those five pillars about company development, self-development, and so on, right? So, so, so they're all there, and it's a really, really great model for leadership. And we have a tremendous, tremendous, terrific assessment to measure yourself against that. Get, uh, you know, benchmark yourself against the best of the best, and then deal with the gaps, right? We don't have to deal with them, but, you know, at least, at least figure out where you are in the game. But... Um, I'll ask uh, leaders, what's the difference between leading and managing? And, 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 and the answer is surprisingly weak most of the time. So, so let me give you a quick uh, uh, definition of those things. So management is the use of directed authority and it's delegating tasks. And you've, you've seen it a million times where someone will say, well, why don't you tell him this? Or... Or perhaps you could do this, try this and see if that works. And even if you do it with a really good nurturing parent tonality and say, well, I don't know, but maybe you want to try that, right? Mm -hmm. That's still managing because it's the use of directed authority. And it makes it very difficult for somebody to say, actually, George, I'm going to go do something else, right? Because you're the boss and you decide, you know, uh, uh, who gets the parking spot and what happens at the, you know, the next salary review. So a lot of people think they're leading when all they're doing is managing with a nice tonality because it's the use of directed authority and delegating tasks. But leadership mm -hmm. is the use of directed influence and it's delegating results. So wow. you don't have to micromanage everything. Just lead by except manage by exception, lead by exception. So give delegate really well. So many leaders think they're great delegators. They're not. They're just bark orders of people and think that's tremendous delegation right but it really isn't so yeah. you've been talking uh, to my employees again huh yeah what's, what's that you've been talking to my employees again huh i've been barking well, orders just people. the ones that felt brave enough to answer my email yeah off so, with their heads <laughs> off with their heads right We're um in. yeah alice in wonderland terrific the other thing i would then say is this last is the last point <laughs> <clears throat> um collaboration the We've got to go from conversation, communication, coordination, right? We've got to get to collaboration. And if you want to know 
if there's anybody watching this, you know, I have genuinely no ax to grind. I've got no horse in this race. Learn about how the man that saved Lego saved Lego, right? Uh, everybody loves Lego. Lego were almost about to go to the wall. And then they got a, an outside CEO, wasn't a family guy like the Henry Ford thing, right? Wasn't a, a, a Lego guy. Saved Lego based on this principle of collaboration. When you as a leader can make can set up a collaborative culture where everybody works for and everyone's trying to help everybody and 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 people in the C suite will share their resources with other people. I saw a great example not too long ago. There was a company whose sales were a little bit behind. And so therefore logistics was a little bit behind. You know, they were a bit quieter than they would have been. And the the guy that heads up logistics said to the sales guy, hey listen, Things are a bit quiet for us at the moment. I've got eight men. I can give you five. If I gave you five of my men, what could they do to help the sales function to get us all busy again or the marketing function? And that's collaboration, right? It's like, how can I help you? And how can we share resources? And, I'm, you know, all that silos, let's break down all of that kind of BS. So learn what the difference is between leading and managing. Manage by exception and, and generate a collaborative culture and, and you'll do better. There you go. That and I, I know the stories you're talking about with Lego. In fact, yeah. the uh, collaboration with the Lego Movie people um, yeah. and how they did that uh, mm -hmm. that helped really re-explode, reignite the brand is yeah. an amazing story in of itself. Um, yeah. And and they they literally uh, gave them free reigns to do whatever. But the collaboration they used to get them to communicate and and incorporate the brand into those movies. That just made them, you know, just such a huge success and re revitalized them yeah. uh, was an amazing story as well. So this has been really insightful. Excellent. I'm sorry, Chris. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. There you go, Antonio. This is really insightful. We could we could spend another three hours going through your book, but we want people to buy it. I mean, this yeah. is a tease out, people. You got to go buy the book to get the deets, as the kids say. I don't know if the kids say that. I just made yeah. it up. There you go. <laughs> so antonio thank you very much for coming on the thank show you. give us your dot com so people can find you on the interwebs please yeah so it's um all the w's mydailyleadership.com and you can find my daily leadership the book on amazon if you download the audio it's me narrating it if you want to hear uh, if you want to hear my jokes in my accent then give that a world too if you want to but there whatever you Five star review on Amazon would be very much appreciated. There you go. And what's the best way to people uh, that are interested in working with you, uh, maybe having you coach them or give them some advice? Uh, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? Yeah. And genuinely, please do. So it's Antonio at mydailyleadership.com. So it's A N T O N I O, Antonio at mydailyleadership.com. And I promise within 72 hours, somebody more than likely me because Alice will kill me otherwise if I don't. But I'll get back to you personally and see how I can help. There you go. There you go. Well, thank you, Antonio, for coming on the show. Thanks to my audience for tuning in. Order of the book where refined books are sold. As we teased out, there's a whole mess of stuff we didn't even get to cover in the show uh, or touch on because it's just jam-packed with data Thanks. and information to make you a better leader. Uh, August 30th, 2022, it came out. My Daily Leadership. A powerful roadmap for leadership success. And uh, like I said, order it where fine books are sold. Uh, also, uh, guilt and shame time uh, for the plugs. Go to goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Voss. Refer it to your family and friends. Five star review on iTunes. Uh, LinkedIn.com, Fortress Chris Voss. Uh, Chris Voss1 on TikTok. And I think YouTube is in there as well. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe. And we'll see you guys next time. Ta ta.